Um, so what we'll kind of do today, it's part two and, you know, part one was, was great and we liked how that all worked. And this is after all a platica. So um, we're gonna follow a similar format. And this might be the same for all future things, which is, you know, um, Katie and Amy will talk a little bit. And I think what we're gonna be talking about today are some larger concepts related to metadata. So like everyone's been kind of working uh, with Dublin Core. Um, uh, so but because of, you know, the realities of, of everything that's going to be happening with collective access, we want to talk more generally about metadata. So talk a little bit about that, and but, but what's really emphasizing what's common about all metadata schemes. And then I'm going to start calling on all of you after we go through that in a QA. and a I just want to, I guess, ask you guys a couple of questions. So I'm going to be putting you all on the spot later. So, um, and then we'll just talk about the next platicas and stuff like that after that. So, um, Without further ado, I am going to turn it over to you, Katie and Amy. I'll let you guys Rochambeau for who goes first. That's not a Rochambeau move. <laughs> but I, think it, I think it means that Katie is supposed to go first. Go ahead, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll 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 um I'll start us all out. Hello, everyone. I think I might have met everybody already, but if you don't know me, my name is Katie, and I am the head of archives and cataloging for the Donnelly Library at NMHU. And um, I thought today we I would start out just by giving you sort of a, a general overview of, of what metadata is and what kinds of metadata there are out there because there are a lot of different schemes uh, a lot of different elements that you can use and um, but they all tend to do the same sort of thing um, depending on the type that you're using which was a really weird roundabout way of starting us out but let me let, let me uh, first talk to you about <coughs> What, what it is, so, so metadata, a lot of people tend to, to use the definition that metadata is data about data, right? So it is, uh, there's like a, a nice long formal definition from the Society of American Archivists, but basically metadata is helping you to capture pertinent information about a particular item. You know, whether that item is an image or a video file or an audio file or an object or a document, metadata is going to give other people context for that item, okay, and all the pertinent information about that item that may not be readily available just from looking at it visually. Okay, and there are a lot of there are actually a lot of different kinds of metadata right so there's descriptive metadata and structural metadata and technical and preservation. All different types of metadata and they all do slightly different things actually let me let me pop that in the chat real quick, so you guys can see what i'm saying so descriptive structural technical administrative preservation all kinds of metadata now the kind that you see most frequently and that most people use is descriptive metadata. And just like it sounds, descriptive metadata describes an item. It describes the form and the content of that item. So that's like the names of people who are involved within that item. You know, if, if it's a photograph, who's in the photograph? Where was it taken? When was it taken? It's all about the form and the content of that item. And you can see then why it would be the most heavily used type of metadata. And it also, descriptive metadata is, is the one that we most rely on to help us find pieces within an archive, right? Because that's how most people will search for things. They want to know a photograph of a particular person, or they want to know information about a particular place or a particular point in time. You know, maybe I want to, you know, maybe I'm doing research on the, you know, the, the bicentennial. So I want to look for stuff that was created in 1976. You know, so that's, that's how most people go about looking for stuff is using those kind of descriptive metadata. Um, now I'll touch briefly on the other ones like technical metadata is basically like the properties of a particular um, um, item or resource. So that's stuff like the file type, 
Um, and that can be important because sometimes you have to know whether or not you have to have a specific piece of hardware or software in order to access something. Like if I have something that's an, a Word document, dot .docx, you know, I know that I have to have uh, Word to be able to access that, right? Or if something is saved in a PDF, then, I mean, most of us have a PDF reader or, you know, we use a, a browser to, to open a PDF, but you have to know um, some particular file types require particular hardware and software, and you get that from the technical metadata. There's structural metadata, which isn't used quite as often um, as some of the others. That's That has to do with relationships between particular items. So um, the best example that I like of that one is um, page numbers. Like if, the, if I have several images that all um, came from a book, you know, and they have different page numbers, that's, that's kind of structural metadata because it's helping you see the relationships between those images. This one comes before that one comes before that one, that kind of thing. Um, and then administrative, this one can be really important. This is, I know, a topic that we've talked about a lot in these platicas, and it's, and it's things that people have brought up as a concern for them, is um, rights and usage. Um, that's the kind of thing that you find in administrative um, metadata. You know, who has the right to use that? How can they use it? Who, um, who is the rights holder? That sort of thing is administrative metadata. And then, oops, I got ahead of myself in my notes. Um, and then there's um, preservation metadata, which is sometimes sort of lumped in with administrative metadata. And that's where you record, record the actions that you've taken with a particular item. So like if I have a, um, an oral history on, um, you know, VHS, right, the preservation metadata is where I would record, okay, so I took that VHS and I converted it to a WAV file or whatever, and that's, that's preservation metadata where you, where you um, record what you've done with that item. That's a lot of stuff, right? It's a lot of different kinds of metadata. It's a lot of different kinds of information. But the thing to keep in mind is that when you are recording your metadata, you don't have to have every single type of metadata for every single type, every single item that you have, right? Um, because you, you, you simply may not have the information, right? For a photograph, I might know who's in it, um, but I might not. <laughs> you know, so you can, you, you don't have to put too much pressure on yourself thinking that you have to have, you know, 20, 25 pieces of information about a particular item. You know what you know, okay? And the more, the more information you can give on an item, the better it is for other people because the easier it will be for them to find something useful for them. Um, but just, just keep that in mind that it's, the, the more you can give, the better, but it doesn't necessarily have to be every single thing for every single item, okay? And um, as I said at the top of it, really the descriptive metadata is going to be the type that you use most heavily and that you have most readily at your fingertips. You know, who's in this photograph? You know, we, we've talked briefly about some of the the really big items that you want to record, like you want to have a title for your item, right? You want to have a description so that you can at least tell people what's there, you know? So, so keep that in mind that, that that's really what you're going for is to, um, to provide as much as you can, mostly in that descriptive field. Um, sort of some of those other types of metadata is, is more sort of inside baseball uh, for archivists like Amy and myself. Um, it's all great information to share um, if you have it, but don't get too stressed out by some of that stuff. Does that make sense? Shane, was that, was that kind of what you were? That was great. <laughs> yes, that was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see. So really quick, because something just popped up from Marissa. Well, Marissa just says thank you. So there you go. So yes, the, the vote of, of that was helpful. So thank you, aside from myself. So so Amy, yeah, hi. Um, uh, what, what would you say is uh, that, that you wanted to say about any of that or follow up or a different thing or talk yeah. about? Uh, I think Katie did a great job. That. 
Yeah. Great job, Katie. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's very, um, very thorough. And I think um, there's specific, maybe a subset of what Katie covered that applies to digital projects. Not everything that metadata encompasses applies. Like um, one of the first projects that I did it, in the job that I used to have was um, measuring books to put in, put, to put the size in to be, um, I don't know, is that structural metadata or anyway, to, to and, and that's because librarians need to know what shelf it will fit on, right? Like if it's oversized, it needs to go in a different area. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of considerations that this project doesn't even really need to address because we're only dealing with digital stuff. So that's really the only comment that I would have, but Katie did awesome. Okay, great. So cool. So, so, and I think what, what will be good and, you know, uh, I think some of the questions like, cause I, what I really feel like, um, so, and, well, anyway, before I move on to other stuff, does, is there any questions that anybody has right now, you know, for Katie or Amy um, about any of this or about the, the, you know, the metadata form you've been working with and stuff like that right now? Nope. Okay, going once, going twice. All right, sold to uh, no one because no one had any questions. So, um, uh, I, so now we're moving to the plotting part of things. So I am going to start calling it on everyone. And I really kind of what I wanted to um, ask you guys. So in some ways also, this is, um, I guess you consider this a little bit sort of um, market research, I guess you can say for Esteban in particular, as, as the weird Zoom lady probably announced to you all when you logged in, it's recording. And of course, um, Esteban will resume later. And we do have you know, we've started to start to think a lot about um, uh, what is confusing, what is messing about messing from metadata, because that's going to be a, a relevant and germane question as as things start to get developed. So I think that I'm, what I'm going to ask everyone, so you can, I'm going to tell you in advance, so you can think about it until you get called on and you know, I'll have mercy on the first person I call on is, you know, just to ask everyone thoughts about what they've observed about metadata. Last time we kind of talked about, do you have any problems or questions about it? And this is just a bit more reflective in what you've observed about metadata while you've been working with it and organizing it using Amy's form. Um, you know, what, what, what interesting things that you've thought about, but also what have you found either confusing about metadata, like, I, to me, there's a lot of um, ambiguity uh, sometimes with certain fields, like it might just say date and you don't know which date it is, uh, just as an example. So what is confusing uh, in general about metadata and what is also missing from metadata that you've experienced so far? What would you say you wished was in there in Dublin Core that isn't there? Just to start to open up, you know, sort of break the ice about just kind of your observations and thoughts. Um, and Marissa, I see your message about having not received it. Um, it's probably got sent out several times, but in confusing ways about with links to um, links to like uh, the, uh, oh, well, there you go. Jordan shared it with you. It's a Google doc, which might've been why it got lost because probably said it was from Google and not from Amy or myself or something. So, but it's there now. So you can grab it there out of the chat. Um, and so, yeah, so I am going to start calling on people now. Um, and I'm just going to go down through the order of how they appear on my screen. Um, and so I'm not uh, picking on you, Daria, who gets to go first. Hi, Daria. Hi. That's twice in a row now I've gone first. I know. Maybe it's the, That's okay. my, my algorithm favors you in the Zoom. <laughs> um, well, you guys are probably a little more advanced at this than I am. I'm So I'm looking at the spreadsheet. It is in our our folder, our drive. Um, but I've, I haven't, I've been observing and learning as I go, but I haven't actually had my hands on this ap application of inputting metadata, so to speak. And, and I really want to talk with Miguel about that, but um, I'm still, I'm still converting JPEGs to TIFF files and I've got almost 250 images. Yeah. at the moment that I'm still working on. And so, okay. 
So you guys are probably a little more advanced than I am, but I am paying attention when I'm on the on the yeah on the Facebook particularly or any kind of um, research. I can see the use of these tags, you know, and okay, and it's helpful just to observe that. And now I have, I think I have a pretty good idea of yeah what to do. How how have you been organizing your data about about these? Uh, conversions that you're doing these conversions from TIFF well, like. each okay so we have a complete ancestral line for 16 different people uh -huh. that could be four generations it's up to 16 generations on some people yeah each generation has a folder and each folder has subset so I've got sacramental records I've got census records I've got Spanish archival records I've got photographs newspapers yeah um and I think anything you told else me, I can find. I think you told me you're kind of just putting all these into a folder. Well, so each, yeah, each participant has a folder, and okay. then each generation for that participant has a folder, a subfolder, and so you know we've got one candidate might have seventy five images, you know, and depending on the the lineage. Uh -huh. So I'm keeping them all in their for in their folders. Yeah. So exactly. you're not you're not right now needing to track any information outside of the objects themselves. So you are this is a little before the metadata part of things because you're not. Yes, but I'm also see I'm using a form, a word document form that tracks each lineage, each generation rather, both. Yeah. And for each generation, I've got say let's talk, I've got a, a married couple, my mom and dad. I have their baptismal records if they exist. I've got their marriage records if they exist. I've got their um, newspaper from their announcement for their wedding. I've got their photograph. I've got all these images in there, but I'm also sourcing my items in a third column. Yeah. So I've got the person's name, the dates of the um, event, and the third column is my source citation. Okay. And so it'll be a little easier for me because I already have that information on this Word doc. When I do the when you start to do over, the forms, I'll just do it. Yeah. Okay. There's right. a lot. I've I got a lot of stuff in one file. I mean. Yeah. So so your thing will need to be to sort of translate the way you're organizing data and fit it into metadata when the time comes. Yeah. I mean, I started out with having to be very organized and structured because of the the, the participants that we're using. We we a lot of them are part of the New Mexico Genealogical Society. Yeah. DNA project. So yeah. we already have their their lineages with all the sources and yeah and so i've been extracting records and putting them in the proper context and format yeah okay all right so, so you're 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 doing metadata but it's not in any metadata template yet is kind of where you're at right so but you'll be ready to do it when you're ready i think so yeah, yeah. i think so okay if i could weigh in i would say that that kind of organization is fabulous groundwork for your metadata you know, because that's that's half of the half of the the sort of battle is is knowing what you have and where it is and having some sort of organizational scheme. And then when it comes to, you know, you know, adding your images and putting in your metadata, you will know when you go to put in your metadata who this person is, what kind of record it is, the it's date. Eight. So, so you're actually kind of pre okay, so. pre prepping your metadata. I think I think that's great. Yeah. And and there is no wrong or wet, right way to go about how you organize your your materials that's that's up to you you know some people like to do everything strictly you know chronological some people like to do clump things together by subject some people like to clump things together by an individual if you're doing something that's very genealogy focused um as long as you are consistent in the way that you do that you're 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 helping yourself an awful lot i mean metadata is not just the physical act of sitting down and putting in your metadata you know, it is about knowing what you have so that you can describe it later. So I think you're actually, I think you're, you're actually already prepping your metadata, you know, yeah. even if you don't think of it in that way. Well, I'm, this is what I've been doing for three or four years yeah. with these particular, this pro, other project that I work on. So mm -hmm. it has to be very structured and yeah. yeah, it's basically in one, in one line, one generation, person, place, time, date, location, and, and source. So I'm lucky in that regard, but yeah. there's a lot of work ahead. So, 
So to follow a little bit on what Katie said um, is, uh, I totally agree just so to build on what she said, which is like, yes, as, as I get to you, because I it's something I think we hadn't talked about in the prep part about it is we've talked about it from the point of view of like, here, this is how we want you to prep stuff. It's going to be based on this, like kind of jumping ahead to and talking about like a template, which is, but what Daria points out to my mind, which is really good is it's okay to organize in your own way before you put it into that sheet. You don't have to start from that. It might make it easier to do that if you're starting from ground zero, but yeah, the more organized you can be in your own way, so it's good. So I'd be interested to hear from others if they are doing, if they have their own structural thing, because it helps us think about what might be useful to help you guys when it does come time to transfer it into a template. So it, whether it's here or later when I chat with all of you separate, feel free to let me know like if you're doing it a different way before you're approaching um, you know, Dublin Core or any other metadata thing. So cool. So thanks, Daria. The next person on my screen is Pat. Hi, Pat. So kind of same questions. Like, what have you observed about metadata while you've been organizing stuff? What have you found confusing or any other thing about it? And what have you, what do you think is missing? You know, if you're like, God, I really wish there was like a field for this because this is a common you know, that I come across this all the time and I don't know where this might go or, you know, just any observations. So sorry, I didn't mean to editorialize there, but yeah. No, you know, th that's fine. And um, yeah. I think I came a little late into the project. So I feel like I'm pre metadata template <laughs> okay. stage. And um, so some of the things though, as I'm doing it, because we landed up having lots of uh, material, lots of documentation. How do we take it and scan it? How do we copy CDs with all these people? What's taken uh, on the Folklorica side has taken a lot of time is who were some of these people? So for example, uh, 1960, 1961, 1962, had the same activities in them. So um, we, what I've done is put them on a passport drive from the originals that I checked out. Now that I think they're all done, it's looking at all of these and identifying people and, um, and how do we organize an activity that took place every year at the same time for many, you know, many moons um, and people that have passed away, um, no connection to families. Do, you know, do we just assume we can put their names and, and anything that we have on there that does kind of bother me that the copyright thing, I don't want to insult anybody or give anybody uh the wrong impression that comes back and say gee you put a picture of my mother up and and uh we didn't even know about it even though i might not have even known who the the, the child was i mean the adult child anyway those are some of the things on the loretto side i have been talking to people for quite a while now i would say pre-interviewing um, pre-interviewing, getting stories that are not really documented in on film yet. Um, people are thinking what they want to write. They tell me what they want. They tell me their stories. I, I take the notes on them. And, in, and I'm just now getting permission to say in January, I'm going to call mid-January. I, I want to do a face-to-face -face in your home. I want to do you know, I want to be part of this. Some don't want to be part of it and just like their story told. And then the other problem is I've had some stories told to me and they want the story, but they really don't want their name included. So <laughs> do we do we leave them out of the project by that request? Um, so I think a lot of ways I'm, I feel a little, insecure with with some of this and the templates because i i feel i'm a little far behind the rest in the group in in what i in the work i'm doing so far 
it's been very collective. It's been trying to organize. It's been trying to scan, trying to copy uh, discs that have pictures on them. Albums are a problem. Um, I don't know if that's answering your question or contributing to the platica, but that that is where I am. And yeah. Okay, cool. Well, well thanks, Pat. I mean, uh, just to answer some of it, were you going to say something, Katie? I didn't know if you were. No. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, after oh. after you go first. I oh, had okay. thoughts. Yes. Uh, okay. I'll go. I'll go quick because uh, it's not much of what to say. What I was going to say, Pat, is like. I think that a lot of what you are dealing with, which to me is a very valid concerns about permissions and stuff and will be related to especially that part of metadata. I'm hearing it a lot as like, you know, what it is is in the side of people misunderstand about permissions and and sometimes those kind of ways in which uh, assets in an archive get used and how they work and what they do. So, what I'm hearing from you is that there needs to be a lot of clarity about some of that and that that's the thing that we need to address and it will eventually relate to metadata, but I think you're right to point out because we are we deal with messy things it is things people don't understand that just because it's a picture of their mother that they don't have copyright on it if somebody else took it and things like that and that's a part of the community archive part so that's the part we always have to try to remember too is. In dealing with community archive, there's the things that they are, and then there's the things of the way people perceive them. And it sounds you're, like you're dealing with a lot of perceptual stuff from your people who are donating stuff that we have to help get really better with helping you with tools on how to do that. So, so that's what I would say about it. But I'm going to let Katie talk more specifically into the points of metadata. So, yes, go, Katie. Well, actually, I was going to say something a little bit more um, sort of big and squishy, which is that I I, um, I don't think you should be worried about being behind everybody else or being where you are. You are where you are in your project, you know, and hopefully this, you know, we would like the Manitos project to, to continue on into the future and new people come in and people finish their projects. So, you know, there, there's not a, I don't think there's a place you know, specifically where you should be. You are where you are. And and everybody has, you know, we all have different capacity as far as how much time we can spend on things. We all have, you know, differing amounts of, you know, collections that we might have. Some people have more, some people have less. So I would say, you know, be, um, you know, be comfortable with where you are in the process because this is a process. There is almost never a beginning, middle, and end to these sort of things. You know, it is it is it is constantly uh, being updated. Um, it, you know, especially in a digital realm. Um, you know, the, the, there, there's always more to be added. There's more that can be done later. So, you know, I would say be comfortable with with where you are and and where you are is where you should be. You know, and then and you'll have time later to to do more stuff and to to um, you know get to the metadata. Um, now, I would say as far as if we, we do want to talk specifics, you know, when you were talking about, you know, maybe some people want to tell a story but don't necessarily want their name on it, that sort of thing is between you. And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Shane, um, I tend to think that's between you and the person who is doing the, who you're interviewing, you know, like the Manitos project, we don't, you know, we don't have necessarily, to, to my knowledge, a, um, um, a standard, you know, like, I mean, we can, we can help you make agreements, but if you make an agreement with somebody not to share their name, you don't have to put their name in. You know, if, if you do an interview with somebody and they would like their name withheld, what information you put into it, into the metadata is up to you. And if you have that agreement with them, and, and I know that's happened before with other um, um, oral history projects that I've seen, you know, sometimes people want to be anonymous or they don't want their stories shared until after they pass away. And that is an agreement between the person, the interviewer and the interviewee or the organization that's doing it. Um, so I would say that's that's something that you can consider on your own. And, and that's not something that we would impose on you. Does that sound right, Shane? That is a very, oh, sorry. Billy, were you gonna say something, Pat? Oh, just, you know, thank you because um, I really appreciate these and I and I actually look forward to working with you more, Shane, to get specific direction and 
and and guidance. I, I'm a teacher by profession, and so I, you know, I approach things I think in backward planning too much. But yeah. thanks, Amy. Uh, I mean, Katie. Uh, yeah, th that gives me some ideas because they do want their story, and for whatever reason they have that they just want it done to share their experience, but they didn't want their name. Who knows why? Yeah, and, and what I wanted to point to, to so yes, Katie, that's right. And it, to me, what it emphasizes and what I heard a lot and what Katie said is this is about this being a community archive, right? We get to make up way more rules than a lot of projects that are following some kind of guidelines that come from somewhere else. So these things like anonymity and things like that, you and they get to decide that. Like that's that's the empowering part about this being a community project. So I'm glad Katie pointed it out because it's a nice thing to highlight about, yes, we want there to be some structural rigor to the archive so that people can find things. But when it comes to rules like that, like, yeah, if your person wants to be anonymous, they can be anonymous. We, we love the story and there's nothing, there's nobody telling us that we have to include their name because of some somebody else's rule or whatever. And so I just wanna say that, and I see that Dario, you were raising your hand, I think. Were you raising your hand? Yes, I just wanted to okay. add, I, you know, just to give you yeah. some moral support there, yeah. Pat. Um, it's, our, it's our duty to hold to our word in our agreements with these people. So, you know, it doesn't mean you can't tell your story or share their story. It just means you're honoring their request. So, yeah, I think you're good. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. So, and to address Katie's other point quick, you know, before we uh, move on to the next person, like, what, I'm glad that she went, what did you say, squishy, Katie? Because I, I want us to always remember this is supposed to be pleasurable and fun for all of us. So don't stress out. Or, and like Katie says, don't feel behind. Like you're doing this because you're it's gratifying. Don't lose that thing. So just want to want to take an opportunity to say that every time there's an opportunity to say that. So, so yeah, so, so cool. So uh, the next person is Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hello. Um, yeah. I have, as you know, lost some time because of the library problems. We yeah. you know, have, I've been in the library two times in the last maybe month and a half, two months, because it's been closed and they've been working on it. They've removed a lot of the documents in offsite storage. Kathleen's had problems because of the photographs. So I think they're all in offsite storage and we're hoping that right after the first of the year we'll get it all back. But that's where I am. I'm still trying to get all the locations for the 350 students that we picked. Um, there are only some missing. I've been putting it in an Excel file so that I'll be able to, you know, figure out how many came from Dixon eventually and that sort of thing. But I haven't done anything beyond that. Anything I can do from home, I'm doing. Okay. So kind of you're in a similar situation that we were kind of finding out is this your, your pre-template, you are collecting metadata and you're organizing your own stuff, mm -hmm. but you kind of are just doing it in your own way until you can access the materials that you need to access. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Right now I have... Yeah. Probably 70% of those students I have the locations for, but yeah. there's also yeah. the, the files that I can't get to. It tells me where the rest of them came from. Okay. And just a, a question that I'll just ask you directly, just so that I know, so that you have an opportunity to this if possible, is, and it seems like there's sometimes some confusion of it. Do you have access to um, Amy's uh, ex or uh, uh, spreadsheet file so that you can kind of get a preview of what metadata might look like for the data that you do have that you're organizing yourself? I don't. Okay. But that may be my fault. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll make sure that you, well, it's there in the chat so you can grab it. Jordan very helpfully shared it. So I'm realizing that this has been a thing that sometimes 
that that's the access thing has been that. So while you're waiting and until you can that, you might just want to have a look just so you can go like, oh, I can do this and it'll really help me in the future. So, yeah. Okay, okay. I definitely will do that. And yeah. the, I was in the library last Friday, I got to go in and yeah. discovered a thesis from Tramontina that was oh. very exciting. Yeah, very exciting because apparently they go back every year for a reunion. Oh, and th okay. this particular year that she was documenting, they had done some kind of raffle and had a list of names. I found three of those names on my list. These wow. people were probably in their 40s or 50s and I, with addresses. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that you know, I can get in touch with, you know, write them a nice note, get in touch and see if they will, you know, come back. And I got excited because it was not just a list of names, you know, yeah. and years they graduated and where they came from. It was real people 20, 40 years later. Yeah, well, it's nice. You have a you have an additional reference list for for your own purposes. It is nice to get a list of names sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, well, cool. Thanks. And, and yeah, we'll, we'll be talking soon. I'm glad you're able to get back into the library again, at least for a little while. Yeah, me, me too. Every they're, once in a while it's open and I go right over there. <laughs> they're making you wear hazmat suits or anything, are they? I beg your pardon? You don't have to put on the hazmat suit with the like. No, they've got oh, the, where okay. the real problem was, they've got that whole section all right. Closed off. That, that's still closed off. Okay, cool. Some of the records I want are in there. <laughs> oh, well, that is too bad. Yeah, cool. Well, uh, Dana, you're the next person on my screen. Yeah. I think you're still on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, basically, I'm in the same situation as Daria. I um, have some photos and what I've done is basically I have a sheet or a page for each photo with um, all the different information. So I kind of have just in my own way have been doing that documentation. I have a sheet with the name of the person in the photo who when the photo was taken, um, who owns a photo, kind of just the typical uh, list of what we're supposed to do. And but I haven't actually put anything in any sort of metadata um, program at all. So and I the photos are mostly um, different people from the community. I originally got hired to do the museum or the San Cristo heritage area in San Luis, but because the director passed away in the beginning of October, things have kind of been put on hold there. They do not, they're putting, the, the board is having a meeting this coming Friday on the 17th. And they did tell me that I would have access to the museum after they approved that in their meeting. But I'm not sure if it'll be within the next couple of weeks or after the first of the year. Because there, there's going to be photos, but then also documents to scan. So, uh, so I think if I can get all these other ones that I already have scanned to mm -hmm. upload and put those in the metadata, then I'll be that more far ahead when I start on the museum portion. Okay, cool. And and like with Rachel, I would say just sort of, even if you're still more comfortable in your own organizational strata, go ahead and start to compare it. So like ease yourself into thinking so that you don't have to go back and, you know, reorder too much. So I think that that's a, a similar situation and things like that. But, but Definitely everything that said said earlier still applies along all kinds of ways. Um, yeah, so so with and, and it sounds like and this is like sort of a thing too. It does sound a lot too like you know some of you are dealing also with a little bit with the technical metadata and trying to 
especially like with things with photos and things like that, there might be a, a thing where you are dealing with that or what kind of file it was or where it came from kind of thing. So um, yeah, I had another thought, but I forgot what it was. By the way, Katie, just so you know, I can't see you anymore on the screen because I'm scrolling through people. So feel free to just jump in because I would be ignoring you if I because I can't see you anymore if you were going to say something, just so you know. Okay, I won't be shy. I'm not usually. Okay, just just wanted to tell you that because I can't can't see you anymore. And and same with you, Amy. I can't see you anymore if you were wanting to jump in. So um, so cool. Well, thanks, Dana, and I will be talking with you soon. I think because I'm curious to hear more also about the museum that you will maybe soon have access to. That's very exciting. So so cool. Uh, so next on my list is Jordan. Hi, Jordan. Hi. Uh, for me, it's going pretty straightforward. I think it's just, I've been kind of in the boat of have, getting everything organized and just because of the nature of what I have, it's kind of pretty logical already to have it in a, in a way that organized that kind of parallels the metadata. So uh, yeah. feels pretty clear. Okay. So just because I know that you've done massive um, things have and have been dealing with this, like I'll, I'll sort of return a little bit to my questions just to see if you had any thoughts and you don't have to, you can say, I have no thoughts about that at all. But like, what have you seen that's like, is there stuff that, and particularly, I think I'm asking this a little bit too, because, you know, as we've talked about before, you're dealing with material that seems to have some sort of extra contextual things that could be addressed that aren't often, because I think metadata often assumes like photo or document. So what have you yeah. seen missing or that you would want to see in metadata that, that, you know, where you're like, I wish this was being tracked or something. Like, what are your thoughts? If, well, if you have any. I yeah. really like the idea of the platform that can link to other documents. Okay. I think that would be, that will be a really interesting thing to, to start working with. And then I just have found in, um, in in the the spreadsheet that we had i was putting just some extra information in which was it um under the description so the description so that's where you're putting all the extra information yeah yeah did you see anything that jumped out that was like, this should have its own anything, or you're happy using the description? Do you like the flexibility of that or? Yeah, that, it seems to be be working. Um, and especially I feel like the, to be being able to link it to other things would be really yeah. useful because a lot of times it is talking about connections or. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, okay, so cool. So, so, and that in some ways is that like, Metadata would be the thing that's going to determine the linkages, but you think that you like the tools that are going to really exploit that metadata sort of like a step down into that process. So that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Amy or Katie, if you, just to ask you guys just to refer to this, because this seems to be kind of the thing. Is there any part structurally like of that next step down outside of metadata that just do you have any thoughts about in regards to that at the moment? Not not if you don't also, again, you don't have to, but I was just wondering if like there's things in metadata that help with the process Jordan's talking about, like the linkages. Is there any extra things or something that should be emphasized there? Yeah. Nope. Okay, good. Well, okay. I, 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 I was try, I'm trying to think because, yeah. you know, from it from an institutional standpoint, we usually build those linkages like through controlled vocabulary, you know, like through controlled uh, like standard subject headings. That way they're usually within a, you know, within some a database. A lot of times they're hyperlinked. So, you know, I can click on a subject heading and it will pull up everything that has that same subject heading. But um, that is some, you know, that that's a that's a more structured way of doing it. And we're, you know, we really haven't been, we really haven't been stressing that kind of, of controlled vocabulary um, here. I mean, I think that there is a field for subjects in the um, um, metadata worksheet, but that, that starts to get into a whole other, <laughs> a okay. whole other, other realm of, of um, 
mini headed Hydra thing when you start trying to, to use controlled vocabularies like LCSH. Um, there are both structural issues with that and um, textual issues and contextual issues um, uh, to say the least. So, so a lot of times in, in sort of more formal, um, formalized institutional archives that I've been a, a part of, um, that's how those linkages have been, um, ha have really been structured. So, okay. I, so, I, so I don't really think that that's going to be um, something that we lean into heavily. So it's going to be, a, and, and if anything, it, it's going to come much later. We need to get some things sorted before we start to think about things like that. So, yeah, and I'll just chime in to say that when I was working on the Omeka system that we had previously, um, one of the things that potentially can be confusing is that if you're trying to connect items within that same system, like they both have to be there, right? You have to create them and then link them together. And so um, that's just like a warning, I guess, because uh, or something to just kind of be aware of that you are going to have to touch an item twice usually because you'll need to add it and then add the second item and then go back to the first item to add the the linkage unless the new system works very differently and somehow can automate that process which would be great but um mm -hmm. and, I, and i'm thinking in terms here of like the relation field that dublin core has to um to make connections like that where you can put in hyperlinks um the way that that field gets used i think in more formal settings is like linking items back to a collection that they're a part of but um you certainly don't have to use it that way you can definitely link things one-on-one -on -one, like a photo of someone and then an oral history that they did or you know those those cool kinds of connections so that's the only thing that i would have to say about that i think cool thanks no and actually you remind me and, and so there might be a thing because i realized that will be a thing right like often those connections will be something's been in the archive a while here's a new thing so it's going to be important to remember that it's going to be a two-step process like adding the thing and linking it to the first thing isn't going to be enough you want to go back and go back to the first thing and it'll be a, that's helpful to remember that that's going to be every time really because I don't think there is a magic thing that does it yet that I know of. So, or I haven't heard about it yet. So, but well, yeah, so cool. So thanks, thanks for that. Um, yeah, oh yeah. I have a, I have a question. Um, there is one person I actually haven't photographed, but I've made um, arrangements to meet with her. Uh, she's originally from San Luis, lives in Denver. But she was actually nominated by the National Endowment for the Arts to receive an award for her culture uh, making. And so if we did some of her photos, now that you're talking about linking things, that would be really great to be able to link her article that was done uh, through the NEA to, you know, to just kind of link that to her information. Would I just need to contact you guys at that point? Because I mean, that hasn't, you know, I was just thinking about that now that you're talking about it. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if, at least speaking for me, I don't know if we know or have the answer for how it goes. But what's nice about it is it raises the question for something to look at. Like, even like, for instance, like what Amy just said about that field is starting to be aware of like, Clearly, we should start thinking about what it does mean to include links and things like that that go outside of the archive and what that means and how we present those kind of things as 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 much as possible. So to me, it's like I'm glad I'm glad this came up because it's a thing we should think about and make sure that there's a a good solution that's going to be sensible for that. So I suspect it's going to be very much like what Amy just described is it'll go into a, a field and stuff like that. But but so. The process Amy described would probably be, to my mind, the best answer for that so far. If I think if I'm understanding your your question correctly, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Pat, I, in your hand. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Can I just ask a, sorry, a question? Yeah. Yeah. Who is the person uh, that got the honor in culture? Dana. Uh, Josie Lovato. Yeah. Oh, 
because I'm in a culture club and I hadn't heard and I just wondered if it was somebody in our in our club, but uh -huh. nice. Yeah, her name is Josie Lovato. She's been doing culture for probably 30, 40 years for a really long wow. time. She's in her late 80s now. Wow. Yeah, and just saying from the archive, the more culture stuff we have, it's better because that stuff is so amazing. So you guys should go to town on the culture thing. So Katie, you were going to say something. You raised your hand and I interrupted you, but what were you going to say? No, no, no. I should have raised my hand to begin with instead of just popping in. Um, yeah. I was going to weigh in on internet links and just as a sort of precautionary um, message is that links aren't always permanent. And I think every single one of us has come across, you know, has clicked on a link on a web page and gotten a 404 error. So you just need to be aware that there is not permanence um, with, with particular links because you're depending upon whatever that outside website is or outside entity to keep their website up to date, which they don't always do. Um, so, um, so, you know, if it is something that you want a more permanent record of we would have to have i think a more of a conversation about how to capture that um, um there are some places online that sort of capture old websites like internet archive and things like that um so i, I just think that that's kind of a, a little bit of a um a bigger um uh issue there with linking to and linking to anything that's outside our control yeah 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 good good point and yeah that's kind of like was like oh yeah this is going to be a whole other thing hadn't even thought about the linking to the outside so there it is it is problematic in that way yeah yeah um so the next person and so i'm gonna marissa it's you and i'm gonna answer a question that you have in the chat or at least point out something to address the issue you're bringing up, right? So, and it's one of my favorite things, so I'm glad I have an excuse to talk about it, about what I think we're gonna be able to do, right? So, uh, or at least if I'm reading your question the right way, we're looking at creating, which is not a new concept, but we wanna see if we can include it within the archival build, which is a thing that it's probably has an official name. I've been calling them person objects, which, uh, Estevan hates because it's literally object to find a person, but for the purposes of the archive is it, it would be kind of like a landing place for individuals. So a prominence, like somebody's grandmother who's 50 people's grandmother or something. Well, maybe not that many, that's a lot of grandkids. But um, uh, so that we can point object, we can point things that deal with that person to a page that is that person. So that's kind of the idea of, person objects or whatever we're going to call them so that 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 person has a literal presence that can be the nodal anchor for every but thing in the archive that deals with that person so that's a concept we're trying to explore but so now that i've said that which i let's uh, i'm glad you're excited about it you're the next person so tell us uh tell us what you think about um the questions brought up or whatever you want to talk about oh this this um these last two trainings have been very helpful because um i got in i think in july and i think the whole project was taking going into transition mm -hmm. and i um found out in july june july that i was going to california for the project i was working on so i was in transition as well okay um Anyway, long story short, I reached out to about 48 people via Facebook to see if anybody wanted to be um, to be part of the project and archive stuff from their family collections. And um, I've gotten three solid people. It might have to do with the ages. <laughs> anyway, a um, couple of them just lost their dads, but that's been interesting because they've had to both of them are executors, so they now have had access to all these documents and things, and they're already finding a process. And after these two trainings, I've been able to meet with two of them. I'm meeting with another one tomorrow, and I've been taking notes about what's kind of coming up for them, and they've been able to sort of start designing 
what they think they're going to share and kind of a theme they're each going with. Uh, and it's uh, Santa Fe is born in the 60s. But what seems to be a typical theme with all of them, including me, I don't know about this fourth person, is that we are of that first generation where our parents' names were changed in the Santa Fe public schools. And now with these two persons, their dad's death, it's been hard to get records because mm -hmm. some of their stuff is connected to their name before the Santa Fe public schools changed their names. So it's been issued. There's been issues with their uh, veterans records, blah, 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 blah. So it's just kind of interesting that that's come up. Um, but anyway, uh, my point being is um, I feel like I've been really able to organize more since these last trainings and have a better idea of how to bring them in. And I've been holding space for each one of them and taking notes as they talk because they're, they're processing a lot as they're mourning, but they've been able to have a couple of months of not having to contact me. I really felt like I needed to give them that space. Uh, two of them had their fathers pass away in September. So, uh, and so we are heading towards a deadline to get a majority done by end of March. Um, and so, um, I'm coming home now for a month and I'm going to be meeting each of them with my scanner. And I think the biggest question for me, do we have a range of specifications for file size, photo size for scanning so I can make sure I have the optimum? Yes. So, okay. and, and um, so I think we, we have decided on this was like a decision that definitely Amy and Katie had input on. We're definitely doing lossless TIFFs. And what we did settle on was what is an RS standard, which is 600 DPI. So lossless TIFFs, 600 DPI, those are the two main things that you really need to do for file size uh, and, and specifications. I would also recommend to you when you are scanning to... Uh, because this will help both with file size and just kind of organization is you probably have a setting on your scanner where you can um, kind of cut down the scan area to like say your photo takes up the crop it order of it, crop it, but don't crop anything out. So like think of the photo as an artifact and crop, like say it's got a border and the border has like OC tears or, or whatever. Well, tears or information or writing, Make sure that stays included, like treat the photo as a thing. So, you know, cut around it, but cut that big chunk of white space out, but do that. And keep I would what's, say- Keep what's yeah. there and get rid of the excess. And I would also say if things are written on the back to go ahead and do treat that as a separate oh, okay. scan and uh -huh. have it, It's to me, it's helpful to just have it next to where you're doing. So when you organize, you can connect those things. Uh, so one thing that I'm hearing from you maybe, so it's like maybe what else you've noticed is this idea of people who have separate names, which would not only have been in your situation, but would have happened earlier for people who might have had to have gone to schools or things. There's a lot of reasons why people would have multiple names of, over their life specific to the Menitos experience. So I'm hearing for you that to make sure that there is a way to easily you know, track people under their multiple names, which I think is very easy. And Katie and Amy, you can go, that's already there, so don't worry about it. But it's a thing I, that I'm hearing that you think, is, am I correct in hearing that you think that needs to be a thing that is included, is making sure that we can have people with their- How about this is what, what I'm really saying is we are the first generation that Spanish wasn't our primary language. Our parents, yeah. our parents who were born in the mid forties, when they started first grade, the public school, they literally said, your name is no longer Ana Maria Gloriosa Rodriguez. It is now Gloria Rodriguez. Okay. And the same thing happened with my dad and the same thing happened with their parents. And they're running into those issues and they have birth certificates with those names, the Spanish names, their primary, you know, their, their, uh, their first language. Mm -hmm birth certificates and then later when they're having to get birth certificates later they're now their uh -huh. names that were when they were renamed in public school this was a thing that happened in san right. Bay. so from an archival point of view do you think that there's going to need to be an instrument by which we know that Ana maria gloria martinez or i, I didn't i missed the name that is now gloria and that 
We just make, need to make sure they can be seen both ways. Yeah, by, by having both both certificates. Okay. All right. Cool. Well, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, I don't know. It's going to yeah. really be, in the, it's going to depend on what they, Yeah. each person is coming with something and, and I'm just letting it develop because they also are amid some mourning. Yeah. Clear, so clear. I'm trying to really just hold space for them. Um, I don't, I don't know what mine's going to look like because my mom's been collecting photos for me while I've been out of state. Okay. So I won't even know how mine's going to, because I've got both my parents still alive, yeah. but I have record of that happening with their names as well. So it's been up for me anyway. Yeah. Um, well, and your, inst your instinct to me is right, is to prioritize that human relationships because that makes it all just work better anyway. So right, yeah, right, right, what right. you're doing in that rather than going, I got to meet a deadline or something. So, so okay. and then I have one more question. So uh -huh. Am I going to be the only one that has access to load up to the site or will the participants as well? It will be you. Okay, good. That's what I thought. Just wanted to get there. This trainings that we're all doing, you know, there'll be certain ways to do it so that it all works orderly and efficiently together since there's many of us contributing. The, the key is making sure everybody's things work together so that if some, somebody does a search on the front end, find it. sure. Yeah, they find everything. So that's, you know, really our key of, of making sure everyone gets on the same page training wise and why their metadata needs to all work together is for that particular reason. Okay. And one so of them you. found one of them found the funeral books, you know, where people go to the funeral and they sign. Oh yeah. He found one for her great grandmother and one for her oh. grandfather while wow. she was going through closets and stuff recently. So yeah. um, and then an aunt got really excited that she's wanting to look at this stuff. So now an aunt got a hold of her and brought her a bunch of stuff. So it'll be interesting. Great. That's all. Yeah. That was the master plan is to get things to work that way. So that's fantastic. Yeah. I'm glad. Yeah. To, I'm heartened to hear that people are, that the, the excitement is snowballing for. It's been very frustrating. Out of their closet. So that's awesome. Yeah. It kind of, kind of took a, a long a while for it to get here. So it feels like it's finally kind of working out. Great. Good, yeah. good. Cool. Um, Thank you. So, so the last person we have on the list. Oh, Katie. Hi. Yeah. Sorry. I um. No, I'm I just glad wanted that because like I I won't see you. All <laughs> so I'm glad you're using the right fan feature. I, I just wanted to have you know just just respond in two ways. One of them in a very um, specific way, and one in a more squishy way. So let's do the the specific one first, which is when you were asking about um, you know the parameters, 600 DPI uh, tips. Just so that, that you all know, that's that's called a preservation copy. And what we're trying to do is capture materials at the highest quality that we can in that format, which is a lossless format, um, which means it's not compressed and it's not and it's not lossy. Because sometimes a file, a file will degrade, you know, like a JPEG or something like that, even if you don't do anything to it. So what we're trying to do is create a file that really you can use as your master file, because once you have a 600 DPI TIFF as your master file, then you can create JPEGs from that. You can create lower resolution images from that, because also, you know, some, some computer programs have a hard time opening TIFFs. A JPEG is much easier to open, it's much easier to share, but you always have that original high resolution lossless file to fall back on. And we've also been having conversations about what kind of files we actually want to make available online, because usually with you know, like an institutional um, collection that we put up online, like I will keep our TIFFs you know, on, on a server and backed up multiple places to back them up. But what I'll put online is a lower resolution JPEG because, you know, a computer screen, you know, can really only read about what 350, Amy, is that what a computer screen will, will do? I mean, it's because, you know, much, much over that and, it, and it's, it's really redundant, but you still want to have that original um, in reserve so that you could create derivatives later on. So that's what that's that's why we would like that that higher quality one, um, but that that might not necessarily be the one that shows up in the archive, okay? Uh, because because also you know a 600 DPI TIFF, 
it can also take a long time to download if you're trying to download it. Um, so, so those lower res sort of use images um, are much easier to share and much easier for people to to access. So, just so you know, we're, we we um, you know it, it might not be that highest resolution one. I don't recommend the highest resolution one to be the one that's online, but you still want to have it long term because you may this may be the only chance you ever get to to digitize this particular photo before it goes back into somebody else's home. So Shane, did you have anything to weigh in on that before I yes. before I go on to my second point? Uh, well, <laughs> yes, I just wanted to clarify that like the archive will have the master files somewhere in some way. So that will be in the archive. It just may not be publicly accessible. Like Katie says, and we're looking at what model works best to do this. And you know that that's a lot of the reason which the thing is, is yes, your master file will be in there. At some point you'll upload it. There's probably a tool that we're gonna use, which will create those lower resolution JPEGs. So when Katie says that they'll be in the archive, what she means is like, when somebody's coming to the archive as a visitor, they'll only ever see the JPEG. They'll only ever be able to do that. And a lot of what this also does too, is this in some ways, is an instrument that we'll use to kind of protect sometimes people's control over those images. A lot of the security concerns that people that are donating photos have are like, well, someone will just grab my photo and put my grandmother on a mug on Redbubble, right? Sometimes the JPEGs really are, by being res lower resolution, not only help people have a smoother internet experience, but they also protect a little bit about that. So. We are asking for the lossless TIFFs. Don't ever bring it, like, unless you have to, don't bring the lower resolution JPEGs. So what she means is what will appear on the archive are those derivatives already. And it's also what anybody might use to create different versions of things or clean up photos or whatever, colorize them is always gonna be derivative. So just wanted to point that out. What was your second point, Katie? Well, um, I will, because it's on the same topic, I'll just answer the question that Marissa just popped into the chat about size, which is a big consideration because a 600 DPI lossless TIFF is a huge file. So um, I was just looking, I, I tend to keep a little example that I use. Um, so I have um, an image that I scanned from um, one of the collections here at Highlands um, and the TIFF file of that image, it's a plat. The TIFF file of that, that plat is 201 megabytes. The JPEG is 2.05 megabytes. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge difference, you know, like two megabytes versus 200 megabytes. Um, and then once you multiply that times 20, 40, 60 images. So do be aware that that is going to be um, a factor for you if you are scanning them at these preservation quality, um, that it is going to take a lot more storage space. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, did you have anything um, follow up on that, Shane? Uh, I was only gonna mention to everybody, so to the room, um, if you are having storage problems, we ordered, they didn't come in nice, so I got to check in on what happened to my other seven that I ordered already, and we'll order more if we need them. Storage is definitely something we can provide. We don't want you worrying about the obstacle of saving it. We'd rather have you have so many photos, we need to send you a four terabyte drive to store scans on. Don't store them on a flash drive. I don't know what you mean by flash drive because people use things interchangeably. Do not use one of those little sticks. Those things will vanish your work whenever you can. So really the ideal thing is have them on a hard drive and back up that hard drive all the time. But that being said, knowing, knowing the world is the way it is, we can get you a drive and then hopefully you have a place to back it up also. But don't worry about storage. That's my main point. So I'll stop babbling now because you were going to say something else, Katie. Yeah. I was. So my second, my second point is a little bit more of a squishier point. Um, <clears throat> when you're talking about giving space for people and that is so important yeah. because this it's it's sad to say but this often happens when you are doing archival work a lot of times it it can correspond with the passing of somebody for the very reason of you know somebody's you know they're they're cleaning out somebody's house or something like that and it can be very emotional um and and so i think that is something very common that you are encountering. And I also want to mention that 
as the person doing the work, you should also give your spout some space too, because the things that you're interacting with may bring up emotions for yourself too. And it, it can be very hard because, you know, we're, we're like, I'm doing, I'm just doing my job. I'm just scanning stuff. But, um, but memory work can, especially if you're doing memory work in a community that you are a part of, can can bring up emotions for yourself. So I just want to be sure that you're that you also take that into account and and step away if you have to. In the same way that you are giving your donor some space, step away if you have to 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 give yourself a little space, to give yourself a little time to process things that might come up um, as as you are um, doing that. And and I would also say I've I have sort of a a community of archivists that I've you know kind of come up in my career with and these are people that I also reach out to because we all do the same kind of work so don't don't underestimate being able to talk to other people who are doing the memory work too as far as um, understanding how you're feeling and what you're going through and what you're seeing so I know that's one of the that is one of those much much squishier topics but I think it's something really important to keep in mind that that this 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 kind of history work can be very emotional for yourself too and that's okay that's okay so all right i'll, I'll stop now. it's all good good stuff so thanks um to uh address a couple of things just because i want to be respectful of people's time and sort of maybe shoot for 5 30 marissa but to answer a couple of your questions before we move on to the to the last person on our list who they know who they are and probably nobody else knows who they are, but well, they probably can tell, um, is no, we haven't decided on a watermark. Uh, it's gonna be a, a different thing. Um, and so we'll address the logistics of the drive thing like separate. Um, but so I just wanted you to know I saw that message. So um, the last person uh, who we have before I do some last things at the end is Craig. Hey, Craig. So what are your thoughts on the metadata thing conceptually sort of thing? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I've said this in past uh, platicas yeah. around the work I'm doing, right? So yeah. the work I've been doing for the last couple of months is digitizing these oral history cassette tapes out of Chimayo, uh, done by a gentleman out there. And it was like actually a really excellent interviewer. So that's been kind of a dream to work with in terms of that being my first project in kind of this realm. But I think that the one, the one structural deficiency that I encounter, right, is that I don't have great Spanish. So about half of these interviews, which I feel like I'm probably and thankfully I'm a minority uh, in that, uh, in this bunch, but I would say that that's kind of the one, cause I'm focusing mostly on subject matter uh, metadata. Cause like realistically in terms of technical meta metadata or location-based metadata, it's, you know, this was a cassette tape recorded in this year by this person interviewing this person in this language. And I feel like that's sort of the technical work uh, in that, but the, the English tapes that I've been able to do, I'm just listing terms that I will put, you know, into the metadata and hopefully that will help people search stuff. But the, the issue is that I'm hoping, you know, can kind of be stewarded by the person receiving that right is to sort of fill out that in terms of Spanish because I don't have it but it's been a real you know it's a loss for me right because there's like fascinating stuff I mean one of the ones I did that was in English that I was able to you know understand um was a woman who was from Chimayo, but she was a nurse in Los Alamos, right? And she began to notice an uptick in cancer, right? In ter and that's in the context of the, you know, the bomb laboratories there or whatever. Um, and she has, you know, these anecdotal stories that you can read about, right? You read about this sort of stuff in academic journals, but this is such, there's such a human edge to it where she was kind of talked down to by the doctors and like, no, like it's, there's not more cancer in your community or whatever. And then, you know, come to find out that, yeah, there, 
the labs are poisoning the surrounding areas and and even more regionally right but so that was that's something that i was devising you know thinking about what terms you know like atomic age atomic bomb medical science nurse um you know inner you know cultural humility and medicine like all of these sorts of things that i think about that that might be searched right because i'm adept as a as a historical researcher at this point in search queries on databases so translating that knowledge into formulating what i think people might be searching has been very interesting cool thanks i, I kind of want to um point out some things just to give uh, everyone some additional context because Craig is dealing with metadata from a very specific perspective as the digitizer and want to point out to people just to kind of be where we were talking about things with the metadata that's coming out of the media lab where these time-based medias are being digitized by Craig and by Sam um, and the, so the process will be if you ever come across some of this kind of stuff from a metadata standpoint is going to be Craig and Sam are going to digitize, say, like Craig's uh, media. He's going to probably follow this process he described, but really the files are going to go up into the archive and then it is going to be the person who owns the material that is going to need to go back and kind of really do the metadata on it. So he's kind of referring to that a little bit and wanted to point that out. So the reason I want to point it out is just if indeed you ever are going to need to deal with material like this and are going to send anything to the media lab is it is going to be a, 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 a an idea where there's going to be a hybrid of the metadata between what Craig's going to be doing from his perspective and how he's doing things and what the original contributor or you helping the original contributor is gonna to have to do. So that process will be twofold in, in stuff dealing with this kind of material that passes through the digitization lab. So I, I think Katie, you were thinking of saying something or maybe you're just nodding, but Craig has a hand up too. So Craig, why don't you tell us what you were gonna say? Yeah, yeah I mean, to respond to that, right? Cause yeah, it is gonna be on right, the people that are providing us the things to digitize. I'm seeing my work as doing as much as I can in that time to like help out the person, right, or help Absolutely. out the community yeah. partner. So yeah. sort of to reframe, reframe that, right? Yeah, it is that I'm doing everything I can uh, in order to smooth the process for the person that will end up uploading that to the archive, because that won't be directly from the digitization lab as i understand it well it's true and i'm i'm glad that you're pointing it out and it's kind of why i want to emphasize the collaboration because often craig and sam are going to be the people who notice things right and part of their job is noticing what might be different about the material in reality versus what the people who are contributing it thought was there right there might be a name on that cassette it might not be the person it might be that person but three minutes in, somebody taped over it and it's really a different thing now and nobody knew that, right? So Craig's process, the, the process he has to go through as the digitizer does add a lot of, let's say, reality to the situation. And so this collaboration between the person donating, the community archivist helping and the digitizer is a very interesting and unique situation in regards to the metadata. In some ways, I guess what I'm highlighting is We've been always talking about this as being really a one person or a one person with their contributor process. And this is one where it really becomes where metadata is a collaborative act, which probably we haven't talked about enough and we should talk about uh, and focus uh, and maybe even have a whole platica about that specific type of thing in the future. So, so I feel like Craig brings up a really interesting parameter for us to talk about. Katie, what were you gonna say about stuff? Well, I, I was just going to say this, this really brings up one of, yeah. I mean, if not the most important reason for, for having, for having it be the driven by the community and by the members of this community, because no one understands the community the way its own members do. Um, and, and, you know, somebody from outside the community 
in this in the south we used to call it from off someone from off um which would be like me um you know i you know somebody who is from this area somebody who is from the town or knows these, they, they might they you know they will be able to pick up on place names and proper names and and community events in a way that somebody from outside would not be able to you know something as simple as as street names i have a i have another archivist friend who's doing some transcription work um uh on on oral histories and the person and they've, they've already been done but the person who did them wasn't from that area so they had no idea of these these street names she was just like question mark question mark question mark. you know because somebody who has lived there and, and been a part of that understands what's being said and that's that's particular it's particularly tricky when you're doing oral histories um i mean it can be tricky for for also documents and things like that but it's it's particularly um sticky when it comes to, to oral histories and it's so important for people who understand the content to have the input on it and to have the final word on on um transcription and things like that yeah you remind me that me and Craig were looking at a transcript that a friend of his kindly did for him. And Craig, what was the word? Contextually, you realized that they were saying scapegoat, but it was like something that doesn't mean scapegoat at all. And uh, yeah, like, so yeah. It, it's an article and the my sister translated it. That's who right, sister, has, sorry. has fluent friend. Spanish, right? But to her understanding, which she mostly learned in Chile, right? Because she lived there for a number of years. But to her, it said toothbrush right, and toothbrush. contextually. So I've been meaning to take it up to my neighbor, you know, because I'm friends with my neighbor to see what he would say. She, her, her and I both came to that it meant scapegoat because um, that's what would make sense, like Shane was saying. But yeah, in Spanish, directly to English, right, it's toothbrush. So like that's even that's an even more layered issue because to even do translation in this region would be very is different right because it is a different spanish and i don't think that necessarily outsiders you know myself included i did not know that when i moved here and then kind of came to find out the history of the spanish language of the region uh since i study history and that's all you know that was very interesting to me but that would mean right that doing that translation work would work you know at least needs a consultant in terms of a native native speaker to this place to this yeah this location That's, our, it's specific, all kind of our specific northern new mexico spanish yeah well one other thing i wanted to point out really quick and then I, i'll get to the closing kind of thing well really quick in regards to what craig's doing just for context for everybody else he's pulling keywords manually which is a time-honored and noble process for doing these kind of things and is going to be really necessary for the metadata field for that one of the nice things that we're going to hopefully be able to do, and it's kind of one of those things technology can help for us, and it comes, it gets back to the linkages and how things go together, which is, you know, we have wonderful AI driven transcription things, which can tran not only transcribe audio materials, but then render them into what's called optical character recognition, which is searchable by database. So Craig's doing manually a thing which can now be enhanced by the fact that the transcript, which will be a separate thing than the recording, will be searchable. So it, we're in a realm where now technology is allowing us to make time-based media somewhat searchable. So this will be a thing that will be available to people and is going to enhance the ability for people's things to be found, right? So, so and, and Amy's right, they're flawed. So they really do have to be, and, and it is a thing, you do a transcription and then you go back and you have to basically do read it and usually correct it and edit it. And, and it is a thing, and we talked about before, like related to the thing of our specifically New Mexico Spanish, even makes ones that will do Spanish transcription needs even more corrections than usual because of things like Craig's toothbrush. So, so yeah, so thanks for pointing that out, Amy, and the thing, because it is going to be a thing. Like, it's not a magic bullet at all. Still needs work, but it helps with the searchability kind of thing. And it, another issue with that, too, is that if you have um, mixed languages, mm -hmm. which we do a lot in New Mexico, right, um, mm -hmm. they, they almost always choke on those because they want it to be in English or in Spanish, but not both. So right. another thing to watch for. 
Yeah. And it is things like we found out Otter doesn't do Spanish. So, and I think we found like another, uh, a Otter clone that is in Spanish <laughs> that we haven't tested it yet. We found it, but we haven't tested it. So well, uh, hopefully at least that gets us 70% towards a accurate transcription kind of thing in regards to that. So cool. Well, thanks, Craig. Thanks for the, and uh, introducing a lot of these concepts that we can talk about. So before I do my final thing, um, well, two things. So the first I think would be, um, does anybody have for the moment, so this is in our Platica mode, any, any questions for anybody else or anything they heard from someone else that they just wanted to say something? I, a lot of you did that in the chat or already, but wanted to give a lot of opportunity to say, do any of you have something you wanted to say about anything anybody else shared there? Um, and so Daria had a question in the chat. Um, can you please restate the goal for scanning and converting digital images 600 DPI lossless TIFFs non-compressed. So um, Katie really kind of addressed that. So this is a standard that has been adopted by um, archives in general, and often they are according to a whole large schema by the National Archives, for instance. And what all of the people that are doing that kind of thing and deciding these things are balancing longevity of files, uh, accessibility by the means of this meaning, is this the thing going to be readable and useful one year, five year, 10 years from now? Uh, there's a lot of factors. I won't go into as many of them as I can, uh, but what they arrive at is they kind of go lossless. Yes, of course. This file type is probably common. 600 DPI is a size that is reasonable. An eye is not going to have a problem with it. If you expand it, it's probably not gonna have a problem. And they balance all these kind of factors and arrive at something like 600 DPI lossless TIFF to make this be the standard. And so that's the reason why, cause that's like a thing that a bunch of people have said, this is gonna last for a while and it's gonna be useful in this way. And so we try to follow those standards when we can, cause they give usefulness and longevity to the files. Did I go ahead and say that right, Amy and Katie? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I would, uh, the only thing I would add, and thank you, Amy, for dropping that link, um, that's sort of a, that's, that's, that's sort of a, just sort of a rule that it basically, it just like, like Shane was saying, to make things easier and to kind of settle on, on something that we're all kind of doing the same, but I will say that those, it, it's also dependent on the size of the original image. Like for most photo prints, you know, if you have like, you know, the prints that you picked up at Eckerd or Walgreens or wherever back when they were doing that, then you're looking at 600 um, DPI. Um, I have in the past had big collections of um, um, slides. So if you're talking about, you know, and, and there was a time in America, you know, and it's sort of Americana when everybody had their, you know, their little slide carols and they would show slides at home and stuff. Slides, I generally do at 3200 mm -hmm. DPI. Slides, or, or if you are scanning directly from a negative, you know, because sometimes like I have, I have my own family photos that I have negatives and I don't have prints of those. So if I'm scanning from a negative, then it's 3200 because your original image is so small. Um, so just keep that in mind, but, but you know, just for your basic prints, um, then usually it's the 600, that but you don't need to, you don't need to go that, you don't need to go up to that 3,200 for, for something for a print, you know, a four by six or a, you know, five by seven or something like that. Only when you're doing, dealing with those very, very small original images, like a slide or a negative. Very good point. Cause I often forget to mention that, which is that standard is simply for photos, photo prints being scanned. There are whole other NARA, NARA standards for, like Katie says, slides, negatives, things, which leads also to your question, Marissa. So your old sepia black and whites are probably prints on paper. So they would be treated the same on a flatbed scanner, but there are gonna be older phototypes that are totally different things than that, like daguerreotypes or tin types and things. There's an article on our blog where I talk about really earlier photo things, but most likely you're probably gonna be dealing with prints of photos from film, negative, you know, and so those are pretty much photo things and would be treated the same from the archival perspective in that kind of way, so. I, I would say too, still scan them in color. 
even even yes. though the photo is a black and white, still mm -hmm. scan it in the full color. Um, Good to know. And um, and and especially with sepia because that does give you context there as well. Um, yeah. And if even if you have cyanotypes, some of us some of us might even have cyanotypes, which are the ones that um, if you've never seen a cyanotype, it's blue. The printing process is blue. Oh right. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, so Marissa, if you're interested, go find my, it's called like Ancestors Photographs, part one or whatever, probably should do a part two at some point. Um, uh, that, so Daria, you said you had one more question? I do, thank you. So a uh, large majority of the work I'm doing is extracting a digital image off of, let's use family search. Mm. These are mostly the Sacramento or census records. Well, they... The default setting for downloading an image from that company is 200 DPI. Mm -hmm. So I download the image to JPEG. So I download it to my, mm -hmm. my um, computer and then I can open Photoshop. I don't know how else to do it mm -hmm. and change the image size to 600, mm -hmm. save it as a TIFF file. Mm -hmm. But then there's an option and it's, it, so it, the question was non-compressed, right? Straight out non-compressed, okay. So is that process? Because that's the only process that I can think of that will work for this. So what you're dealing with a lot of, and it's kind of interesting because it's related to what we were talking about earlier for protecting images by having JPEGs as the public face for things that are, are probably bigger somewhere on the back end. And Family Search would totally do this. In fact, most places that host images do that. that that's exactly what they're doing. They're giving you 200 DPI because they don't want you doing anything else with it, pretty much other than looking at it. So you are kind of reverse engineering things. And you know, uh, your process is OK. It's a good process. Uh, it's probably going to be where you're going to not be happy with a lot of it because you are upsizing from a smaller file to a bigger file, which never is good. Like, okay, so what's the solution? Then? There isn't one. You're doing great. You're doing a great thing. I'm just telling you, like, in practicality, you can only scale down. Scaling up really just starts to generate digital artifacts. You probably right. notice that your images are blocky, but from an information point of view, you're really about the information. So a lot of what you're doing is fine. So I don't want you to feel bad about it. I'm just going to tell you, if you start to expand it and it starts to look weird, that there's really going to be not a lot you can do about it. So, yeah, so far, um, so far they're looking okay. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, it's either give you a 200 DPI JPEG or convert it this way. And it is something to put in thought and to think about. And Katie and or Amy, do you have any thoughts about this predicament, like from a technical or any other point of view really Thank for you. this? Well, I think it came up in another context where somebody was talking about using equipment that didn't have the capability to scan at 600, yeah. which is a thing that some people might run into their scanners or, or they're taking photos with their phone and it just doesn't have the capability to produce that, that level, right, that resolution. And in my opinion, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I would not take a 200 and put it in Photoshop and make it into a TIFF. I think Mm -hmm. it's not going to provide what this the 600 would do as the original file right it's not a preservation copy at that point because you can't recreate the original document with that image so then you all you have is a 200 so you upload a 200 i mean that's that's what you got right mm -hmm. i mean there are limits in this world and we have to live within them unfortunately so yeah. Okay, so 200 DPI JPEG or turn it into a TIFF file? Um, again, I don't think that that's a big, if, if you're starting with a JPEG, then mm -hmm. making it. it into a TIFF isn't really going to provide any benefit to you. And okay. it's just going to take up okay. your time and, and make a bigger file that isn't going to give you the yes. outcome in the end. Huge yeah, file. definitely. I appreciate that. So, that answers yeah. my questions. Thank you. So, and, 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 oh, sorry, go ahead. No, yeah. I, I just wanted to say to, to keep in mind that, that you know, these sort of standards that we give to you are best case scenario. This is what you should do if you can, okay? If you can't, do the best that you can. You know, any, um, and this is true with, with any part of this process, 
-hmm. because because all of this like archiving in general can be very very daunting because it feels like there's never an end to it and and there are too, so many little pieces to it and so many tentacles any any step that you take is taking you further down the road toward preserving your history so so yeah there there are these sort of standards that you should be shooting for but if you can't do that do the best that you can yep. you know and and you will have done more than than was done previously you know you're you're further down the road than you were yeah. it, it is going and it is definitely a watchword for this particular archive which we probably haven't done a good job of saying enough because we want to focus on helping you do the best possible thing you can do but yeah the philosophy of this archive is we'd rather not we'd rather have it then lose it because it's not meeting the NARA standards or something. So we'd rather have the thing and have it preserved than lose it. Because a lot of times in what we are finding, like, you know, particularly like, because a lot of stuff comes through things like ancestry and stuff, this is where the stuff's coming from. We don't know where the originals are or people have lost them. And sometimes they have 300, you know, DPI JPEGs from the eighties and that's, that's what's left. So rather have it than lose it in this quest for perfection, I guess, has been in the, as, as I think that was Estevan's phrase is in this, rather have it than have it per, or lose it to perfect or something. Yeah. I would add in one more caveat if I could. Yeah. I'm yeah. the queen of caveats. Yeah. Um, um, just keep in mind, both if you're doing your own stuff and when you're talking to other people, yeah. don't throw away the originals. You know, oh, yeah. even even if you do scan it at 600 DPI a TIFF, you know, the digital surrogate is never, ever going to be a, a replacement for the original. It is a surrogate. That's exactly what it is. It's there to make it easier to share and to and to hopefully, you know, have a safeguard because it's stored on the cloud or something like that. But, you know, 20, 30 years from now, what is our scanning technology going to be like? I have no idea, you know, um, and, and, you know, places have gotten in trouble with that before of scanning things or microfilming things, you know, with the latest technology of the time, and then you throw out the original, and then years later, something even better comes along. The federal government has done that, by the way. Um, so <laughs> you, you might come into problems with the census because certain censuses aren't, the, the originals are no longer exist. Um, so, so yeah, just, just keep that in mind, you know, if you're, you know, talking to, to donors in your communities, um, they should still do everything they can to keep their originals because nothing is ever going to be as good as that. When I have to tell campfire stories after somebody talks about the hook in the car window, I tell everybody the horror story of the fact that all those newspapers were scanned to microfilm in 1964 and then they threw them all away. That's my horror story for campfire stories. So, um, so yeah. So. And if you've ever tried to look at a photo that was published in the newspaper and then microfilmed, oh. Uh, it's they're bad. horrible. They're horrible. Where, where now we could scan it. You, you know, we could have scanned that original with a D screener and maybe gotten a pretty good image, but not from the microphone. Yeah. 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 So um, I, I'm going to, in a second, ask Amy and Katie if they have any last final thoughts on this platica before I do a brief sign off thing. Um, but also, does anybody else have any questions or things that they wanted to share with anybody else? Just want to make sure that you guys have a chance for that. So yeah, so Katie, it's you shook your head. You don't have any final thoughts on today. Amy, do you have any th final thoughts on today? I just want to wish you all really good luck and have you all take care. I'm probably not going to be involved with the project in 2022, but I really wish you the best. And it's been so great to meet all of you and hear about the cool things that you're doing. So yay. Cool. Thank I'm, you, Amy, for all of your work on the project. I'm, I'm glad that you said it because I was about to say Amy is going to really hate me for pointing this out, but <laughs> it's not going to be at the Platicus in the future and that we just want to say thank you, thank you, Amy, because you have brought so much to this project and I'm so excited that you have new adventures to go on. You're and so kind. Like it's been so great. Meeting I just all want to you. say thank you. Yeah. Thank so. you. So I'm great. glad you said it first that you were going because and so but want to express appreciation entirely. So. You bet. 
Yeah, and, and stuff is coming in on comments for you. So you should see yeah. that. So that was going to be one of my main goodbye things. Um, I just want to give everybody else a heads up on what will come in January. We are going to continue the platicas, right? Um, and, you know, kind of shaping what that's going to be. But I want everyone to be hopefully that and excited about it. And we will probably continue the same format. So uh, when I send out announcements, I'll probably give you guys stuff to think about because I'm going to keep calling on everybody because I kind of like it actually. And it's kind of fun. So um, so that we're going to try to make these platicas, platicas, right? It really emphasize that process. So be ready to come to talk with whatever it is we decide we're going to start doing. And they will be monthly. And we will also, because they seem to be working out really well, monthly Manitos Project will also be doing kind of the meetup thing. So it'll be platicas and meetups because the more everybody gets to know everybody, the better. So that's the main announcement. And I can't think if there was anything else, but that was going to be the main things. Next body cuz and saying thank you, Amy. So um, unless anybody else has anything they want to say, I'll sign off and send you all off to uh, your holiday madness. Yeah. Everybody in the new year. Hey. Bye. Okay. Bye, everybody.